Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first Digital History Seminar um, this academic year. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Will Finley from the University of Sheffield. He's a PhD student working on a rich library funded um, project together with the University of Sheffield, and he's looking at sort of the technological development of book illustrations. Um, he's going to talk to us today uh, about the pictorial publisher, agents, technologies, and the illustrated book in Britain, 1830 to 1850. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak, and to all of you for coming, and to those who are joining us online. Um, I'd just like to be begin by outlining my background um, in order to get a perspective of um, why I'm here speaking this evening. Um, I'll then give an example from my thesis in order to outline um, outline my approach before moving on to talk about um, what was outlined in the abstract, um, namely the pictorial publisher. Um, so just a bit about my background, um, which feels almost like a disclaimer. Um, uh, I began this project without a background in digital history or to use a widely coined phrase, the digital humanities. Um, I didn't possess the ability to code in any language, uh, nor did I have the re requisite knowledge on how to engage with any real digital methods. At the beginning of the project, the question that dominated my thoughts centred upon, centered upon what digital techniques can be adopted in order to formulate a new history of book illustration, a rather broad question that I grappled with for a long time. Naturally, being a first year PhD student, I began to think big. I approached computer scientists in order to see if we could create a fancy new algorithm that would use machine learning to find similar properties in, considerable, in a considerable data set of illustrations. We even talked about the potential commercial value of such a project. Um, but it took me a number of months to realize this is actually the completely wrong way to go about this project. Um, and in fact, the questions I should have been asking or to have related purely to the history of illustration, and then to consider whether digital techniques could help to answer those questions. Um, so when I eventually began to ask the right questions, I discovered two things about the historiography concerning the history of book illustration that I wanted to address. Um, first was how factional um, the study of book history is. Given its interdisciplinary nature, it's hardly surprising, yet it was startling to me how many separate and distinctive histories there were. Histories of technological development, of the economics of publishing, of the literary, literary salience of illustrations and the relationship between word and image, have all provided distinctive avenues into the field of book illustration. Consequently, I began to wonder if I could incorporate these strands of historio historiography into one rounded history of illustration. I also began to consider the ways in which illustrations are used within academic publications. More often than not, than not, they tend to be used to examine a particular genre or subject. For example, how the visual content of illustri illustrations contributed to the popularization of, say, fictional literature. Um, and as a result, I decided that I wanted to reverse this methodology. And I wondered whether I could use the genre or subject to tell me more about the history and variety of printing practices, particularly during the first five decades of the 19th century, when me mechanization was firmly at the development stage. Um, it struck me that this approach would allow me to frame the history of the book and print within a greater understanding of the cultural effects of the book as a material object. So partially led by my data, which consists of over 6,000 books and approximately 100,000 illustrations, but also because of the predominance of liter literary historians and historians of the illustrated book to focus their attentions towards the novel and other forms of literary fiction, my interests lie in subjects that can loosely be described as non-fiction. One of the first subjects I became interested in was topography, and I wanted to spend some time talking about the relationship between printing and the development of topography in the 19th century. So from the beginning of the 18th century to the mid-19th century, topographical works were arguably the most frequently illustrated in Britain. In 1827, it was suggested that there was, quote, no department of art more universally accepted to the taste of the English than that of topography. And certainly there was no country wherein the artists have so generally excelled in this delightful and interesting branch of study as in England." End quote. 
Understandably then, topographical publications have traditionally captured the interests of art historians within the wider scholarship of landscape art, concerned primarily with the theoretical and aesthetic debates centred around the sublime, the aesthetic and the picturesque. Only recently have scholars began to rescue topography from its traditionally obscure position as a rudimentary understudy to the canon of landscape artists. Yet their focus remains rooted to the significance of what is painted and engraved within these illustrations without any real acknowledgement of how the production of these illustrations changed. New techniques as well as the industrialization of printing ran parallel to the ever-growing popularity of topographical literature. The introduction of steel plates to produce book illustrations in the early 1820s was seized upon by both artists and engravers. Steel engraving not only elevated the engraver's status within the production and commercialization of topographical works, but also helped the publisher to drive down the price of a production so as to increase not only the number of illustrations, but also the number of copies. So an example of these changes can be found in the artist and engraver William Tomlinson's Views of the Rhine, published in 1832. He published his work in parts at a price of sixpence, with three plates accompanying each part. Although the subject matter of the prints was not greeted with a great deal of enthusiasm, the price of the numbers was a source of astonishment. Quote, we really cannot say where the cheapness is to stop and daily look for some publication which the purchaser will be paid for taking. Steel, steam and extensive circulation may bring prints to this at last. End quote. What I found most interesting was the rise in what I've described um, crudely as embellishments, small illustrations and medium and half page illustrations. Um, which alters the way in which topographical works were produced. The, the sophistication of wood engraving, particularly after 1830, provided publishers and authors with a relatively cheap alternative to intaglio printing techniques, while maintaining a high standard of aesthetic design that could be imprinted in relief throughout the text. So each dot here um, represents a single book, and obviously the higher the dot is of the graph, um, the higher number of um, that, that type of illustration there are. Um, and so the shift in this produc the production of the visual is clearly part of a larger concern to reformat the topographical book. Robert Sears, in his, pre in his preface to a new and popular pictorial description of England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, and the British Isles, published in 1847, made clear the salience of the format of the book that the book would take. Quote, from the materials for such a volume, a large folio might have been produced, but our object has been to condense and arrange in as, as small a compass as possible all the useful information the subject can afford, thus giving to the work, to the public a work at a comparatively, comparatively trifling expense, which details all that can be learned from the far more expensive and bulky volumes. Wood engraving also provided a solution for publishers who wished to reflect the representation of movement involved in tourism and travel within static descriptions, something that Ron Broglie was termed the phenomenological critique of technology. In-text illustrations provided the means by which readers could virtually travel through the rambles and tours of their authors within the printed pages of the book. These publications, as a result, became far more entertaining as opposed to merely informative so much so that they began to compete with the fashion for illustrated novels that began to sweep the urban publishing houses after 1835. One notable example here is The Wanderings of a Pen and Pencil by Francis Palmer and Alfred Crowquill. Alfred Henry Forrester, who worked under the pseudonym Crowquill, enjoyed a great deal of success as an illustrator, publisher and journalist. His reputation as a humorous illustrator and draftsman was firmly established by his work for Bentley's Miscellany, Punch and the Illustrated London News. His work was reminiscent in nature of William Coombe's mock satire, The Tour of Dr. Syntax, yet, unlike Coombe's work, it was adjudged to be, quote, far less facetious than it was distinctly antiquarian, end quote. The wood engravings, not, though not the most artistically rigorous, were praised for their clarity of representation and the success of Palmer and Crowquill's publication was indicative of the demand for novel forms of topography. I sort of put the um, 
the contents page on the slide there because I think it suggest it shows that the artist had as much control over the narrative of the publisher, hence why um, the artist hand is sharing the contents page there. The rise of the illustrated periodical, and particularly relevant for typography, the Gazetteer after 1830, prompted me to ask questions about the movement of images between literary forms, um, which placed a greater deal of emphasis on the publisher. I should say that I'm not using the word literary and literature. Um, I'm using them as merely a form of reading, as opposed to ascribing them to a particular genre that was common in the, in the 19th century. Um, periodicals such as the Penny Magazine and the Illustrated London News were filled with visual embell embellishments, thanks largely to their ever-increasing ever artisanal nature <coughs> of wood engravers. So I wanted to investigate um, if those illustrations mediated between different forms of printed material and the effect they had on the subject or genre. So by using some open access code by Ryan, Ryan Bauman, I was able to trace matching images in different forms of topographical publications, which led me to look at the shift in power relations involved in the production of topographical works. Um, before the onset of wood engraving, artists, authors and publishers held equal significance in order to synergize uh, romanticism and accuracy of representation. The aesthetic appeal of wood engraving ele elevated the publisher's position within the production of such works. So the topographical, historical uh, and statistical gazetteer of Scotland, published in 1842 by the prominent Glasgow publisher Archibald Fullerton, was designed to re reinvigorate the often dry content of geographical gazetteers that had gone before it. It was stressed in the preface to the work that the publishers, quote, not hesitated wherever they thought such a matter would be likely to interest the general reader to introduce legendary, poetical, antiquarian, and artistical notices of different localities, end quote. It was hailed by the Scottish historian Sir Archibald Allison, who suggested that, quote, there are few books comprising a greater variety of local, historical, and valuable details and none which I would, in preference, read as a source of amusement or entertainment to fill up the leisure hour. It wasn't the most liberally illustrated publication, but contained a number of antiquarian illustrations, both full-page plates and in-text wood engravings, evoking a sense of romanticism through the depiction of Scottish scenery. Again, the wood engravings were not the most aesthetically rigorous, nor were they the most accurate, but nonetheless they became important for the publisher's later topographical works. Um, they provided Fullerton with stock images um, that could be used to illustrate his further publications. A series of scenes of select views of Persia, for example, featured wood engravings that had been simply re-engraved from the Topographical Gazetteer, published two years prior. Um, they were often referred in the text um, for their beauty. The depiction of the port of Monteith, for example, on the left-hand side, as you can see it was described by the author as a very pleasing scene and managed with facility and taste both by the artist and engraver, although it was, much like the other wood engravings, no more than a tailpiece to the chapter. They were used in a similar fashion in Fullerton's other publication, The History of the Highlands, um, an example on the right of the slide there. Again, merely used as an additional visual element, um, usually at the end of the chapter. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, given Alfred Forrester's connections to illustrated periodicals, some of the illustrations found in, a, in the wanderings of a pen and pencil had been taken from cheaper forms of print, most notably Charles Knight's periodical style topographical publication entitled London, published between 1841 to 1844. Um, the shift in how topography was being illustrated did not go unnoticed by contemporaries and is encapsulated in one review of Cyrus Redding's an, illust an illustrated itinerary of the county of Lancaster, which formed one half of that became one of the most popular topographical works of the mid-19th century. Um, and I'm just going to quote halfway down here, about seven lines down. Um, it is doubtless in compliance to the taste of the age that the work before us makes its appearance in a series of monthly pamphlets and instead of being divided into books and chapters in which each separate question, question of antiquities or natured history would be fully and right learnedly discussed, it takes the, po that takes the popular form of a tour 
and leads us along from town to village, from Cromlech to Abbey, after the gossiping fashion of the day. It featured nearly 200 wood engravings, many of which were printed in the Pictorial Times, a rival to the Illustrated London News. The changes to the way in, in which these topographical books were being illustrated after 1830 were often indebted to the mutability of wood engravings that could mediate between different forms of reading material. These developments in the reformatting of topography were met at times with vehement hostility, and it was the, publish which, the publishers which were more often than not held accountable. Led by inventions in the arts, the changes in the style and character of their publications were in judge to have contributed greatly to the reduction in the number of respected antiquarians and topographers. Motivated by innovations in image production, publishers were charged with the deterioration and near extinction of topography in its classical form. So this relatively brief exploration into the relationship between the visual and topography was just a quite a broad example of how a particular subject can be used to investigate the developments in printing and publishing practices. Um, and what I want to devote the rest of the time I have left is to talk about what was advertised in the abstract, namely the inherent tensions that lay behind the relationship between author and publisher and how they played out onto the book itself. Uh, to do this, I'm going to switch my attention to history books um, and to three in particular. Um, two from Charles Knight and one from John Cassell, both of whom were influential publishers of 19th century illustrated books. Um, it was only in, within the last 10 years or so that the publishing history of history books has begun to be taken seriously as a fruitful avenue of inquiry within the history of publishing. Leslie Howsam in particular has provided a deep insight into the publishing practices of history books from 1850 onwards. The second half of the 19th century and the early part of the 20th give rise to the fusion of popular print and academic rigour. The emergence of the professionalisation of history writing, not least as a result of the rise in the number of universities after 1860, engendered a scientific approach to history, disengaged with the philo philosophical tradition of Hume, Macaulay, Smollett and others. Given this transformation in the way history has writ was written, Howsam's justification for our work centers on the fact that there's been a reluctance from scholars to accept the influence of the publisher on the writing and production of such histories. Howsam's use of the correspondence between author and publisher have demonstrated the high degree of authority the publisher possessed in the production of the textual. It has been generally acknowledged that publishers also held a great deal of control over the visual. More often than not, they were the ones that possessed the illustrations, that chose them, and they decided where they would be printed on the page. Similar to topographical works, histories were published in various formats, in parts, whole volumes, periodical formats, as well as scholarly journals. And so the publishers' use of illustrations within these formats were vital to their commercial success. So I wanted to, I wanted to assess the degree of authority that the pictorial, pictorial publisher had on pictorial histories, um, and whether this authority was translated under the page of the material book. Again, similar to topographical publications, the rise of the pictorial history was greatly indebted to the sophistication in wooden group. The ability of publishers and printers to combine image and text in relief shaped the way these histories were being illustrated by the mid-19th century. Illustrations found in earlier popular histories, such as David Hume's History of England, that ran through a considerable number, number of editions, were predominantly <coughs> allegorical in nature, that belonged, aesthetically at least, to the grand history paintings of the 18th century. The developments in wood engraving, however, prompted publishers and authors to divert from this style of illustration in order to provide their readers with a more romantic and antiquarian account of the history of England. As Rosemary Mitchell has made clear, the publisher Charles Knight was the first to, to attempt this. Much of Knight's publishing activity was concerned with the education of the lower classes as a way of engendering a national community. He had, in his own words, become, quote, some somewhat extensively mixed up with the vast changes in the social condition of the people, end quote. His desire to produce popular literature did not, he was careful to stress, limit him to the tastes of the poor and the lower middle class. More, 
Moreover, he questioned the attribution of popular literature to the working classes. Quote, we all want popular literature. We all want to get at the real and substantial knowledge by the most compendious process. End quote. Knight's histories prioritise the social condition of the people in, a t in an attempt to engender this national community. He felt the nation were all too ignorant of the real passages of history, namely the manners and political condition of the great human family. And his, reflection, and his illustrations reflected this concern. So um, here are a few examples um, of how he illustrated his work. Um, he included um, illustrated lettering, depictions of historical objects um, taken from manuscript sources, um, landscape scenery, uh, depictions of dress and costume, and of architectural scenes. A quick analysis of Knight and his publications would suggest that he was in complete control of the work's production. He was in possession of all the woodblocks used, some of which were copied from his previous works, and he employed the authors he employed the authors and he was at the front of its commercialization. Um, so this is a this is a graph of the image distribution of the illustrations used in Knight's history in all eight volumes of his work. Um, and a closer examination of the distribution of these illustrations helped to reveal the difficulties in producing an intellectual, antiquarian and often picturesque natural history that seamlessly united text and image. As can be seen here, the first four volumes are abundantly illustrated. Um, as, the, as the publication develops, the illustrations become more and more sparse. And part of this development has to do with the commercial tactics of Knight. His history was published in weekly and monthly parts, uh, so it is unsurprising to see um, the sort of heavy front-loading of illustrations. Yet many of the illustrations are grouped into these vertical clusters, um, which I think suggests a tension between the visual and the textual. Um, so looking at volume one, which is on the left-hand side, as you can see. Um, we can see three clear clusters of illustrations uh, between pages 250 and 375, around 625 and 650, and again at around 875. Um, these clusters all correspond to chapters that reveal the social mechanisms of the period. Chapters with what he calls national industry, the customs and manners of the people, as well as their social condition, were liberally illustrated, while chapters on religion and the mechanisms of government were far more textual. In volume one again, the social customs of society and the history of national industry from the Roman period to the Norman conquest are liberally illustration, illustrated with depictions of dress, manufacturing and labor, as well as architectural scenes. In volume four of Knight's work, um, the chapter on civil and military transactions from the period of the Glorious Revolution to the crown of George III consisted of 130 pages but featured just 37 illustrations. The chapter on the man manners and customs of the people within that same book, on the other hand, totaled a mere 18 pages of text but was embellished with 31 illustrations. The clustering of illustrations is perhaps even more striking in the second volume, which you can see on the right, on the right hand side as you're looking here. Um, yeah, the second book. The, so, in the second book of the volume, covering the period between the accession of Henry VIII and the end of the reign of Elizabeth I, over 409 pages of the book were dedicated to middle to military history. So in between the two highlighted sections, that's where, that's where we're talking about. Um, within those 400 pages, only 48 illustrations were printed. The striking differences between the ratio of illustrations to text within, these, within different thematic chapters underscores the tensions inherent in the collaborative networks of author and publisher. This despite Knight's control over who wrote it. Knight hinted at the sometimes fraught relationship he had with this group of writers particularly Charles McFarlane, who wrote a consider considerable proportion of the text. McFarlane was responsible for 
um, the portions of civil and military history, um, which perhaps explains the limited number of illustrations printed in these sections. Although Knight praised him for his considerable power of narrative, he did not possess the, quote, prime quality of the historian, impartiality. McFarlane and Knight were completely opposed in their political affiliations. McFarlane was a staunch conservative, while Knight adhered to a more liberal and Whiggish school of political thought. These conflict and political outlooks were played out in Charles Knight's decision to approach the Whig novelist Harriet Martineau to complete his history of the Thirty Years' Peace, which acted as the final instalment of the pictorial history of England, the second edition anyway. A similar, almost regimented distribution of illustrations from volumes five, so if we go back, from five to eight are suggested of the tensions played out between Knight and McFarlane. Volume seven of Knight's history, we keep scrolling through here. Oh, there we go. Um, volume seven of Knight's history, which focuses primarily on the French Revolution, exemplifies the tension between the writing of the author and the illustrations of the publisher, as well as the intricate relationship between political re allegiance and the publishing the pictorial. There's a noticeable cushion of illustrations towards the end of the book, which again corresponds to the chapters on the arts and sciences as well as the manners and customs of the people, where Knight's predominant interests lay. Illustrations of buildings and interiors, in particular, were liberally employed in order to convey to the reader the great progress of architecture in Britain. The full page illustrations within this cluster were primarily concerned with the changes to the dress and costume during the period towards the end of the 18th century. But these full page illustrations were made up of numerous small wood engravings as opposed to an intaglio engraved plate, as can be seen on the slide. The chapter featured a mere 12 pages, five of which were dedicated solely to Knight's illustrations. This indicates not only the power of illustration over the text in conveying these social changes, but also the difficulty in, in embedding Knight's illustrations within McFarlane's text. Um, before the completion of his pictorial history, Knight felt that his role of the publisher and the writer had no bearing on his success. Um, he said, I quote, I may truly say, and I say for the encouragement of any young man who was citing over the fetters of his daily labour and pining for weeks and months of inter uninterrupted study, that I have found through life that the acquisition of knowledge and a regular course of literary employment are far from being incompatible with commercial pursuits. I doubt whether if I had been all author or all publisher, I should have exceeded better in either capacity. And so a comparison between Knight's pictorial history and his later history, published between 1856 and 62, the image distribution graph is of his, his new history here. Um, suggests that this was not always the case. Knight relinquished his duties as a publisher in order to concentrate solely on the literary aspect of his newly titled Popular History of England. He had clearly grown wise to the pitfalls of employing a number of writers to complete this history, noting that, quote, being the production of one mind, I trusted that the due proportions of the narrative from the first chapter to the last has been maintained. Many of the illustrations that appeared in this new publication were simply reprinted from his previous history. But the more even distribution of illustrations in his new work is suggestive of the attempts to write a history for his illustrations. Knight was careful to stress the salience of his images, which he chose himself despite relinquishing his role as publisher. Used, quote, not, mere, not as mere embellishments, but as illustrations of the text. He completely altered the structure of the text in order to in, in an attempt to accommodate his illustrations. He'd been careful to make sure that the social history of the country could run through all chapters and volumes. He presented as a, it as a chronological state history in which the history of everyday lives runs continuously through it. Chapters of all periods were primarily concerned with population and events that affected and changed the fabric of society. Knight had made, cl it clear, it made clear in his advertisement that he included roughly a volume's worth of the history of manners, customs, and the social condition of English society. His second attempt proved far more financially successful than his pictorial history. 
and a comparison between the two underscores the tensions involved within the networks of those invested in the production of the illustrated book. Regardless of Knight's authority and control over nearly all aspects of the production of the first history, including who wrote it, he could not effectively syn synergize image and text to form a successful commercial venture. Knight suggested that he embarked upon his popular history as a result of the oversight made by the liberal pol politician John Russell, who claimed that Hume's history was the only satisfactory history published in the first half of the 19th century. What seems more probable, though, is his desire to respond to his great rival John Cassell's new illustrated history of England, which was being circulated at the same time. Cassell's work proved far more popular. More than a quarter of a million copies were sold of the first edition, and a closer analysis of his use of illustrations may suggest why. I should say, like Knight, Cassell's intention was to produce a distinctly so social history of England. And this is the image distribution of um, John Cassell's history. Obviously, it may be plain to say that there are far more illustrations. But many of the smaller illustrations were similar in nature to Knight's. Various depictions of people, objects derived from manuscript sources, and small antiquarian scenes. But what is interesting about Cassell's work is his use of much larger illustrations. These illustrations were predominantly printed in the centre of the page regardless of the size. So here we have the representation of a pit on the left and the landing of Julius Caesar into Britain, which are found in consecutive pages of volume <coughs> one. Here the illustration undoubtedly takes centre stage and the text is marginalised. Cassell had previously acknowledged the importance of the visual to readers. Quote, I know from experience what an impression illustrations make upon ignorant minds. End quote. Here, unlike Knight, the role of the visual was not to provide an illustrative aid to the text, rather Cassell's images could convey a narrative independent of the written word. These larger images were rem reminiscent of the allegorical illustrations found in earlier works within the philosophical tradition of history, which is at odds with the trend towards the more historically accurate vis visual representations. So here, um, both illustrations provide a dramatic depiction of Boudicca and her army. Um, the image on the left is found in Camden's History of England, printed in 1810. It's an uh, etching and engraving. Um, and the one on the right is the frontispiece to Cassell's first volume. Many of the larger illustrations throughout C Cassell's work conform to this visual style, which suggests to me that more importance was placed on how the illustrations were printed rather than what was, what was printed within them. Their centrality, often dwarf in the text around them, provided the reader with a strong visual narrative independent of the text. Knight's vision was to use the visual as illustrations of the text, whereas I think Cassell envisaged a far more visual narrative that readers could use to simply read um, a pictorial history without the accompanying text. Um, so I'll just begin to wrap up there. This work was quite, this work's quite fresh and, um, uh, and tentative at this stage, but I do think it raises some important questions about the uses of illustration from the publisher's side. Um, it suggests that the power of the publisher is not always translated onto the printed book, and that by examining the book as a physical object, using computational techniques, we can gain an insight into the tensions between publisher and author within word and image. Perhaps more tentatively, these comparisons may suggest that the way illustrations were printed and the format in which they were printed took on greater significance than the content of the image within a, pe within, within a period in which pictorial histories were beginning to flourish. Moreover, I've tried to establish the benefits of using the printed image as a starting point in order to bring together other variants of book history that tend to have their separate disciplines. And finally, from a digital perspective, um, I hope this paper highlights the benefits of using computational techniques to look at both macro and micro analysis. Um, the tendency now with the digitization of millions of images is to look at large scale changes over time, when in fact it can be just as fruitful to investigate one book, or in my case three, as it is to analyze a thousand adopted digital methods. Thank you.